recording. Okay, um, welcome everyone uh, to the January MAS chapter. Um, Vic, do you have any announcements? Yes, as, as I've been reminded to remind folks that those of you that are members of the chapter, uh, about a dozen of you are overdue with your 2021-2022 membership. So please, um, yeah, I know. I can't point the people out. Um, I might be one of them. You probably are. But, you know, just we use that money to um, pay. Since we can't take our speakers out to dinner, we've been buying them, a, a gifting them a membership to MAS. So that helps cover the cost. And we, we still do support the um, RSPBD Institute, even though we are not meeting there. It's a long tradition as well as the fact that we're paying to have some of the artifacts cataloged. So I think we'll just keep doing that unless there's a major objection. Otherwise, I wanted to let you know that next month, our speaker will be Dr. Calvin Myers. Um, and our current speaker was one of our field uh, assistants, I guess, graduate assistants when we did field work a few years ago. Calvin's gonna be talking about Project Recover. It is um, an MIA um, POW project and he was in, he was fortunate enough to go to Palau. I felt bad, the poor devil, you know, tropical sun, warm, clear water. And he was diving to, um, they were, I won't tell you everything, but they were diving on a, a lost aircraft. So hopefully we'll get an interesting story out of, out of Calvin. With that, I don't think I have any other announcements except for those of you that aren't already members of the Mass Archaeological Society, also please consider joining. And while I know that many of you take our companion or the parent uh, video series, Digging In, just remember if you wanna get on the uh, list the, um, to see the this coming season's talks, go to info at massarchaeology.org and give them your email address and they'll add you to the list. Um, it's, is it starting next week, Lindsay? Yes. So you haven't missed any this year yet. No, nope, season four hasn't started. It starts next Wednesday. Oh, and it's, it was very exciting the past four, three seasons. Some really interesting papers. And don't let the title scare you off. Most of the time, I, I find that the papers uh, really get into a lot of the weeds, as opposed to sounding like the, these high level uh, theoretical papers. They really get into artifacts and objects and, and culture. With that, Lindsay, take it away. Okay. Um, so yeah, our, our speaker tonight is Anna Opashinsky, and she is currently a field archaeologist for the Public Archaeology Lab. She received her master's from UMass Boston in 2019, where she focused on the 17th century uh, and zoo archaeology. She previously worked at Plymouth Patuxent Museums and focused on the management and digitization of legacy archeological collections, as well as working on both terrestrial and underwater sites around New England, New Mexico, and Israel. She is also joined by her cat this <laughs> evening. What is, what is her name? Oh, Zelda, she's been coming in and out, so she'll probably make several more appearances. <laughs> well, I do see other cats in the audience, such as Greg's cat, so I'm sure they oh, and, uh, <laughs> Dave McKenna's Dave McKenna's cat. Cat has a cat, so it's a kitty-friendly, you know, <laughs> environment, so. Yeah, it's inevitable. She loves to sit on laps, um, <laughs> so she'll be in and out. Um, all right, let me just share my screen. Does that look correct? No, you're not sharing it yet. Oh, okay. Let me try again. Oh, and again, everyone just remember at the end, we, we will take questions for Anna. So you can send them as you go, as she goes along, if you want. Uh, now you're sharing. How about now? Yes, you are. Perfect. Working. All right. Okay, <laughs> so um, my name is Anna Bushinsky, and I'm going to be talking tonight about researching um, the diet of the early colonial period of New Mexico. Um, and that period dates from 1598, which is the date of the first uh, permanent Spanish settlement in New Mexico, uh, to 1680, when actually the Pueblos revolted and kicked out all of the Spanish settlers 
uh, for 12 years. So it's a pretty early colonial period. Um, and I will prim primarily be focusing on the Sanchez site, which is site number LA 20,000. Um, and that's uh, the bulk of the research that I did for my master's thesis. Come on. <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to talk most about that, and then I'll be touching a bit on some comparative research we've been doing. So we've been studying more of the 17th century New Mexico diet uh, at large. So I'll be talking about a few different sites that we've compared to, um, and that is some ongoing research that I've been involved with with UMass Boston. Um, so I'm going to first just give a quick rundown of the history of this early colonial period of New Mexico, which I said, uh, again, occurred from 1598 to 1680. Um, and leading up to the actual settler colonization of New Mexico that began in 1598, there were many Spanish colonists uh, coming up from New Spain or Mexico um, and exploring the region throughout the 16th century to find gold, wealth, land, and laborers. Um, but these expeditions failed at creating permanent settlements. And one of the main reasons that this happened is because these expeditions had a really difficult time finding enough food to provision themselves. Um, New Mexico is obviously a desert, uh, so it is pretty sparse in terms of the resources it provides. Um, and we have a couple examples of accounts from explorers who wrote about the lack of food. So uh, we have an account from 1540 where an explorer wrote that they had been exploring and then his party arrived at a Pueblo village and he said they found something they prized more than gold or silver, namely much maize, beans, and chickens larger than those here of New Spain and salt better and whiter than they have ever seen. Um, so those large chickens are probably North American turkeys, which they might not have been familiar with, um, but something they're prizing more than gold or silver is the food that they're finding. So they were clearly uh, having a bit of a tough time finding enough to eat. Uh, we have another example from 1572 when an explorer described the area that would become New Mexico as rugged mountain desert so dry there was a dearth of game and we suffered great hunger. So when faced with hunger, um, these explorers often turned to the Pueblos and other indigenous people for food, sometimes trading with them, but also taking food by force. Uh, and this actually set a precedent for unfriendly relations when um, colonists actually came and settled New Mexico in 1598. So in 1598, the colonizing party that did actually establish a permanent settlement um, was led by Juan de Oñate, and he and his colonists um, brought an enormous amount of livestock and seeds to help them set up a colony. Um, so from an inventory that he had to do before he left, we know that there were at least uh, a combined 6,400 cows, sheep, horses, and pigs. Um, there were probably some other animals that they may not have mentioned, like dogs or chickens. So that's uh, at least 6,400 animals. Um, and they brought those and founded Santa Fe, but because many of the colonists that came on this trip were more interested in finding gold or becoming wealthy than developing agriculture, they um, still expected the Pueblos and other indigenous people to provide food for them and to work for them. And this was actually a pretty unsustainable start for the colony, uh, not too surprising. If you don't have enough food to feed your people, it's not going to go well. Um, and it was managed so poorly that in 1607, the Spanish crown stepped in and made New Mexico a religious colony. So under the direction of the crown, uh, New Mexico started to grow. Uh, we have a maximum recorded population of about 2,900 colonists. Um, they were, however, severely outnumbered by the Pueblos, who were estimated to have a population anywhere between 17,000 and 60,000 throughout this uh, early colonial period. Um, and that doesn't include the uh, nomadic indigenous tribes that lived in the area as well. Um, so as part of being a religious colony, uh, missions were built inside Pueblo villages and Catholic friars were sent to New Mexico to convert the Pueblos so that they could be protected as Spanish citizens, um, although they would be the lowest class of Spanish citizens. Um, but the colonists, unlike the friars, still wanted to use 
the indigenous people for labor and food production. So there's two kind of conflicting ideas. Um, so a sort of complicated arrangement arose in New Mexico where Pueblos who lived in mission villages had to work for the friars that had built their missions there. Um, and that often included doing food related tasks like farming, herding animals and cooking. And then the privately owned farms and ranches like the Sanchez site, um, at those colonists could make indigenous people provide food or labor through two different systems. Um, one is called encomienda, which is a system of paying tribute to the colonists. And another is called repartimiento, which is um, where the indigenous people are required to periodically work a certain number of days or hours on the colonists' farms. Uh, slavery probably also happened, even though it was technically illegal, uh, resulting in the pueblos providing a lot of food and labor for the colonists and the Spanish friars, and then having less time to work, hunt, or tend crops for themselves. Um, so due to this colonization, there are several different food waste systems and diets that kind of come into contact with each other. Um, so we have the Pueblos, other nomadic indigenous groups, uh, and the colonists all bringing their own traditions of food and eating uh, and sometimes totally different animals into New Mexico where they're all going to intermingle. Um, so before the arrival of colonists, the Pueblos uh, who were actually pretty spread out and a diverse group without a common language, lived in sedentary villages and practiced agriculture. Um, they weren't necessarily a homogenous cultural group, but the colonists saw that they all lived in these Pueblo villages, called them Pueblos and assumed they were one uh, group. Um, their agricultural practices were pretty similar mostly due to the environment. So the Pueblos grew a lot of maize and corn. That was their primary crop and food group. Um, but they also grew beans and squash and gathered dozens of local wild plant species that they used for food, um, as well as medicines and dyes. For meat, their main source of meat was typically smaller mammals, especially rabbits and hares that they could catch um, close to the Pueblos without having to uh, leave too far from their agricultural fields. Um, they did occasionally hunt large game, which in New Mexico would be uh, deer or pronghorn antelope or mountain sheep or goats. But they often actually traded their agricultural surplus, their extra corn, with other nomadic hunter gatherer groups for bison meat and other large game meats. Um, there were no known domestic food animals, so nothing we would think of as a farm animal. Um, they may have had domesticated dogs, which they would have used for work, and domesticated turkeys, which they kept for feathers, not for food. Um, so the Pueblos were working with domestic crops, uh, plant crops, but not domestic animal species. Um, there were also many nomadic groups in the area, the ones that the Spanish colonists interact with the most are the Navajo and Apache. And they relied more on wild plants since they didn't live in one spot and could practice agriculture. Uh, and they also relied more on large game than the Pueblos did. So um, bison that could be acquired in the Great Plains, um, as well as those larger species like antelope and deer. Uh, and then they traded with the Pueblos for maize. Um, for traveling into New Mexico, the colonists brought cattle, domesticated sheep and goats, chickens and pigs with them, all species that had never been in New Mexico before. So they are, are not native to the Americas. They would have been brought over from Europe. Um, and domestic farm animal meats and their products such as dairy and cheeses and eggs were a major part of the Spanish colonial diet, um, especially because domestic animals became cheap and accessible when enormous ranches were founded in Mexico. So unlike in Europe, uh, general access to meat was more common across the board, um, across social classes in colonial New, Mex uh, in colonial New Spain, um, Mexico, um, although at this time specific cuts of meat likely remained markers of status, not necessarily access to meat. Uh, in addition to meats, a 16th century Spanish cookbook also includes a lot of recipes with wild game, so we know that um, 
Spanish cuisines had a tradition of eating both farm animals and wild game such as rabbits, uh, hares, a lot of wild fowl, ducks, and many species of fish. So they uh, are relying on both wild and domestic animals for their food in Spain. However, most of the colonists would be coming into New, that were coming into New Mexico um, would have been from the Spanish colonies. They were not necessarily from Spain. Um, so they were used to a diet that had uh, more access to meat, as well as some of the new foods that had been adopted into the Spanish colonial diet, like corn and chili peppers um, that would not have been available in Europe and would not have been part of traditional Spanish cuisine at this time. Uh, so as I said, the cheap and ready availability of domestic animals made them a, an essential part of the colonist's diet. And then um, additionally, oil, wine, and wheat bread were viewed as essential Spanish foods and symbolized uh, sort of higher status in the colonists' eyes. Um, wheat was also important to them because of the Catholic identity. Wheat was used in communion wafers. So um, on the other hand, they considered maize and local game meats to be associated more with the indigenous uh, diet and therefore of a lower status. Um, and these views actually mirror the Spanish caste system of the time with uh, European born Spaniards ranking at the top of society and indigenous people at the bottom. So they're kind of mirroring their foods on that same uh, social ladder. Um, so for my main research, I focused on the animal bones, the faunal remains from the Sanchez site, which is LA 20,000. This site was discovered in 1980 and is located about 25 kilometers southwest of Santa Fe. Um, it was excavated multiple times throughout the 1980s and 90s under David Snow and Dr. Marianne Stoller as a field school, and then excavated again uh, between 2015 and 2016. 17 or 18 as a graduate research project um, through UMass Boston, which is how I became involved in it. Um, so this site is the largest known Spanish ranch in New Mexico from the early colonial period. Um, the map here shows all of the areas that have been excavated across all of the excavation projects back to um, So I know the site has a 10 to 15 room house that may have been two stories tall and that's uh, unit A. It had a barn, which is in the unit B area and a connecting corral, which is unit C. Um, we know that there are some other buildings. So unit D seems to be some small farm buildings um, or potentially uh, quarters for the people who were tending the animals. Um, and then we also have at the, the site, a potential tower and a beehive shaped bread oven. So some pretty interesting features. Um, we don't have any documentation about who specifically lived or worked here, but based on the size and the structure of other comparable farms, it was most likely an extended family of upper class Spanish colonists, um, as well as indigenous laborers. Um, we know from dendrochronological dates that were collected in Unit B, the barn area, that the site was built around 1630. And then there's actually a burn layer that goes across the whole site, uh, which was interpreted as the site's destruction in the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. So the site was only inhabited for about 50 years. Um, and this really small window of time gives us a lot of insight into the early colonial period. Um, so since I was interested in diet and food ways, my main research questions um, were, what animal species were a part of the Spanish colonial diet in New Mexico? Um, and what can we learn about it from the, the bones at the Sanchez site? Um, what factors may have shaped the diet at LA 20,000? So uh, uh, things like food availability, traditional food practices, um, so like your traditional food you're used to eating, um, interactions between the colonists and their indigenous laborers, is that changing the way people are eating food, um, status, and also being in a fairly isolated desert environment. So how does that change what people have access to in terms of food? And then, oh no, 
There we go. Um, and then how was food and the diet at LA 20,000 different to other sites around New Mexico? So um, we compared the diet at this site to Santa Fe, the capital city, um, other smaller ranches nearby, and then a religious mission site. And what does that tell us about the regional diet at the time? Uh, so to answer these questions, sorry, I keep pressing buttons. Um, to answer these questions, I analyzed the full existing faunal collection from LA 20,000. Um, so it was about 8,800 bone specimens I looked at um, and identified what animal they came from, so their scientific classification, which bone it was in the body, um, which side it came from. And then I also looked at uh, butchery patterns and pathologies or sicknesses any of the animals may have had. Um, so I'm going to talk about all of the results for that. So to make these graphs a little, <laughs> a little easier, since I know they all have scientific names on them, I put little pictures of the animals into them. Um, so if we look at LA20,000's collection by what we call NISP, which is number of identified specimens, which is simply the total count of the bone fragments, um, we find that mammals make up 96% of the collection. Um, unfortunately, over 6,000 of the mammal bones in the collection couldn't be identified any further than that, uh, but I did break them down into size categories. So um, when we look at that, the collection is actually dominated specifically by medium-sized mammals. They make up 64% of the collection, and that would actually include medium mammals, sheep, goats, deer, and pigs. Um, and then 19% of the collection is large mammals, which includes large mammals, cattle, and horses. Uh, and then the breakdown of identifiable mammal species, which is what is on the chart here. Um, so you can see that sheep and goats make up the most of the identified species. Um, they make up 58%, followed by cows, horses, and then pigs. Um, and all four of these, the top four species in the collection, are all introduced animals that were not native to the Americas. They would have come from Europe with the colonists, um, which means that less than 10% of the bones we found in the Sanchez site are from local animals that would be local to New Mexico. Um, the local animals that I did identify in the collection included deer, rabbits, hares, raccoons, rodents, and squirrels. Uh, and then in addition to mammals, I also identified several bird specimens, including ducks, uh, imported domestic chickens, um, and then also fish bones as well. Um, so another way that you can look at this data is by something called minimum number of individuals, or MNI. Uh, and that's basically a way of saying we have all of these bone fragments, but how many animals do they actually represent? Um, so while the last slide I showed you tends to be an overrepresentation of numbers, um, this is a fairly conservative way to look at your data as well. However, again, we are seeing sheep and goats are the number one species that is showing up at LA 20,000. Um, and then they were followed by a three-way tie between birds, uh, cattle, and pigs. Um, and then everything else at the site had a minimum number of individuals of one, uh, which is, as we go through the rest of the data we see, is not necessarily an indication that all the other species had an equal level of importance. Um, that's just because we had one bone of each type of animal. Um, so a better way to understand the diet is actually to think about how much meat is represented by the bones. Um, so I calculated the amount of meat the, rep the collection represented, because um, like I said, obviously comparing the number of animals isn't always helpful. The amount of meat you get from one cow, say, versus one chicken is very different. Um, so once I did this calculation, I found that beef, uh, which is the red portion on that graph, is the um, contributed the most to the diet, sorry, uh, followed by 
mutton, which is sheep meat, that's the orange triangle, and then horse meat, which is green. Um, and those all together represent 81% of the potential meat weight in the collection. Um, again, those are three introduced European species versus anything that would have been native to New Mexico. Uh, and horse meat might not usually be considered part of the diet. It's not something we eat anymore. And it's not something that Spanish people ate in the 17th century. Um, but we actually have several butchered horse bones in the collection. So someone was eating them um, and they were contributing to the diet at this site. Uh, for wild game meat, so animals that would have been local to New Mexico, uh, we have venison coming in fifth place overall, but it actually only represents 5% of the potential meat weight. And then after that, um, local birds, fish, rabbits, and hares combined still only make up less than 2% of the meat weight in the collection, um, which is actually pretty surprising because deer, poultry, fish, rabbit, and hares were eaten both by Pueblo people and were also pretty common in Spanish cuisine. So the fact that people are choosing the domestic animals um, over these other local species is pretty interesting. Um, so something else I looked at when I was looking at the bones was butchery marks. Um, and there were a lot of different types of butchery marks uh, and modifications that had been made to the bones. So this is in includes burning, cutting, chopping, sawing, um, punctures, and spiral fractures. Most of the butchery marks occurred on medium-sized mammals, um, and then cattle and horses contained an equal number of butchery marks to each other. And this isn't particularly surprising, considering we keep seeing sheep and goats, cattle, and horses as the top three uh, contributors to the diet at LA 20,000. Um, of the butchery marks, 42% were types associated with what we call primary butchery. So that's the process of uh, dressing a carcass, so like the first steps of butchering an animal. And then 29% were associated with secondary butchery. So that's the process of dividing the parts of an animal into individual portions and cuts of meat. Um, this potentially means that people at the site were dressing some of the animal carcasses, probably partially butchering them and then trading them away. Um, although we don't have quite enough data to say for sure that that may have been happening. Um, but one thing that was pretty interesting that we did see was the presence of spiral fractures. Um, and these can be made by humans when they break bones. So when they twist them like this to access the inner marrow cavity. Um, and many of these spiral fractures were actually on bones that don't contain a lot of marrow. Um, so this might indicate that the people living at LA 20,000 were uh, trying to squeeze all the possible nutrients out of their resources. Um, and then this coupled with the fact that people were eating horses, something they might not normally have eaten, uh, indicates either maybe they were short on food or they were trying to be really thrifty about what they were eating. Um, so here's some, just some of the pictures of the different types of butchery that we saw. So the upper left picture is a burnt and butchered horse bone, um, which was one of the indications that horses were being eaten at the site. Um, the blackening on the end of it shows that it was probably roasted. We also have a bird bone with cut marks on it, a cow scapula that's been cut into uh, kind of a wedge shape, like sheared, and then And then uh, the upper right picture is a spiral fracture, the one that gives you access to that marrow cavity. Um, so another type of data that I looked at for LA 20,000 was the age of the animals when they died, um, tr trying to understand some of the breeding practices that the ranch may have been using. Um, I actually used two different methods to try to guess how old the animals were when they died. Um, one was bone uh, fusion and the other was tooth wear. Um, so a tooth wear actually comes as the animal's teeth grind down over their lives. And this is especially true for grazing animals. If you think like cows and sheep are always chewing grasses, 
um, you can measure that rate at which their teeth wear down, uh, kind of relative compared to one another. Um, and then bone fusion actually looks at the rate at how bones fuse when you're done growing. Um, so as different bones in the body finish growing, the growth plates on the end of the bones will fuse together. Uh, and this happens in a standardized rate and in a standardized order. Um, so we can estimate age based on which bones have fused and which bones have not. Um, and I was able to do age profiles for horses, sheep, goats, and cattle using both of these methods. Um, although I didn't have a lot of specimens, so the samples for these were very small. Um, and these graphs look kind of confusing, um, but basically what they mean <laughs> is that um, sheep and goats at LA 20,000 were either killed at a young age or a very old age. Um, and this reflects a farming strategy where males are probably um, culled from the herd at a young age, um, removed from the herd, uh, and then a few of your animals will live to an old age to reproduce multiple times for breeding purposes. Um, so that was for sheep and goats. Cattle actually had the opposite. So most of the cattle were slaughtered at like a prime age. Uh, so they may not actually have been raised at LA 20,000. It may have been mostly primarily a sheep and goat, sheep or goat farm. Um, and then they were potentially bringing cattle in and slaughtering them for food when necessary. Um, and then for horses, we see them living to a very old age, probably serving out their usefulness as, as draft animals or transportation uh, before possibly being consumed. Um, so another thing I looked at while analyzing the collection was pathologies. Um, so these would be bones that have changes on them or uh, any sort of modification due to the animal's health. Um, so there were just two that had something that may indicate a health-related issue. Um, so the upper left bone is a horse astragalus bone that's located in what we would think of as the rear ankle bone. Um, and this bone actually has arthritis. So I put underneath it with the blue background, a picture of a healthy horse bone, same bone, um, but healthy. And you can see that, that the one from LA 20,000 has gotten all these lumps and bumps on it um, because this animal was worked really, really hard while it was alive. So um, like I said, horses were probably used as draft animals um, and as transportation before being eaten as food. Uh, and then this horse bone with arthritis on it also kind of helps prove that theory. Um, the other bone was a sheep pelvis um, that actually had these little kind of bony uh, spikes on it, which I've circled in the right. Um, and this is actually caused by repetitive birthing. So this is from a sheep that had been bred and reproduced multiple times, um, which again, connected to our theory that some of the sheep at this site live to an old age to help reproduce multiple times and grow the herd. Um, so those were just two unusual bones that I wanted to point out that we found at LA 20,000. So the main takeaways from what we learned about the diet at LA 20,000, the Sanchez site, are that the people living there, the colonists, really focused on raising uh, domesticated European species, especially sheep and goats, um, although potentially cows, although they may have been raised um, at other farms. There's not a lot of evidence of eating many local, locally available um, game species, although there is some evidence of eating locally available birds and fish. And then the third kind of big takeaway is that despite being on a farm, um, there is some evidence of potential food stress or a thriftiness with people eating things like bone marrow um, and horse meat, things that may not have been used as much in. Uh, traditional, the traditional diets. Um, it could also reflect different things. So it could reflect periodic food scarcity, um, the farmers trading away the better cuts of meat for profit and saving uh, the lesser cuts for themselves. 
or the mixture of different ethnic groups living at one site who may have had different opinions on which foods were acceptable to eat to them. Um, however, some of the plant remains from the site, which I, I'm not talking about here, um, but some of the plant remains from the site investigated by other researchers show that um, they were also eating plants that the Spanish had deemed like last resort foods and weren't uh, something they would eat unless they really had to. Um, so that does indicate a potential food stress. Um, so that's LA 20,000. Uh, our ongoing research into the 17th century Spanish colonial New Mexican diet has led us to do a more regional analysis of um, both animal bones and the plant data from other sites, so pollen and seeds. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about comparing LA 20,000 to two nearby ranch sites, to urban Santa Fe, so the capital town, and then to Awadavi, which is a religious mission site. Um, this is more a review of the data from other known 17th century sites in New Mexico. Although I believe this past summer, um, a team from UMass Boston went and did survey around New Mexico to identify potential new 17th century sites that have not been excavated before. Um, and those would helpfully yield some new data. Um, so we've done a review here of assemblages that have not been looked at in a while uh, and are some of the only other 17th century sites we have. Um, so the two that I'm going to talk about today are Las Majadas, which is the site number LA951, and then the Signal site, which is LA9142. Um, both of these are other rural farm sites. They're not too far from LA20,000. Um, so Las Majadas is similar in LA20,000 in that it has a large house, has an 18 by 20 meter house. Um, it has a trash midden as part of the site, three corrals, and then three a three room herder's quarters attached to the corral. So this is um, probably inhabited by wealthier colonists, it's another big farm, another big ranch site like LA 20,000. Um, unlike LA 20,000, the animal bone sample size from this site is small. It's only 192 specimens. Um, but to compare to LA 20,000, most of the specimens come from domestic European farm animals with sheep and goats, again, making up the majority of the animals there. Um, and then they also had a number of cattle and horse bones. So it's kind of mirroring what we're seeing at LA 20,000. Um, there were, for wild animals, actually deer identified at this site, and then also a handful of bones identified tentatively as uh, pronghorn antelope and wild mountain sheep. So those were two species we did not see at LA 20,000. And then we used our own methods of calculating meat weight so that it would be the same across all of the sites we looked at. Uh, and using that at Las Majadas, cattle or beef was the, uh, provided the greatest amount of meat followed by horse if it was eaten there and then followed by sheep and goats. So it's very similar to LA 20,000 as to what people are eating there. Um, deer and rabbits are, far outnumbered by the domestic species in terms of how much meat they provide. Um, the signal site, which is LA 9142, is different from LA 20,000 and Las Majadas is that it's a very small farm. Um, it's got a six by 15 meter house and a trash midden. Uh, there's no formal corral. There was a, a area of compact sediment that may have been used to corral animals. Um, but it doesn't have any kind of formal barn or corral or uh, farm structures the way that Las Mojadas and LA 20,000 do. So it was probably inhabited by poorer colonists or people lower down uh, in the Spanish caste system. Um, and the analysis of the remains from the signal site was done in 1971. Uh, and it was actually pretty limited, the amount of information that we could uh, find out about this assemblage. Um, however, what we were able to determine was that the, uh, the specimens that were identified were primarily sheep and goat, uh, and then there's at least one horse or cow bone. Uh, 
So that's pretty similar to what we've been seeing. Um, however, unlike the other two farms, there are a lot more wild animals identified at the signal site. So we see hares, cottontail rabbits, and deer, um, and then also elk, mountain goat, and antelope. So this site had more wild game than the other two, um, which may be a reflection of its location, but it could also be a reflection of the fact that it's a smaller farm and they have to look to other resources uh, for their diet. They're not raising as many animals as the other farms and can rely on their own domestic production. Um, so the Sanchez site, the Signal site, and Las Mojadas were all rural farms. Um, and then we wanted to compare these to urban Santa Fe. So what is the rural area look like for its diet compared to uh, Santa Fe, which is the one town or uh, villa in New Mexico. Um, so it's your more urban area. Um, one thing that's interesting about Santa Fe also is that there were restrictions on who was allowed to live there. So it was only inhabited by upper class colonists. Um, and the assemblages that were looked at uh, were from communal trash areas. So these would have come from multiple families, um, all again associated with upper class colonists. So the assemblage for Santa Fe was 5,000 faunal specimens, so a larger sample size here. Um, and these were analyzed in the 1990s by the same people who excavated uh, the Sanchez site in the 80s and 90s. Um, Santa Fe is dominated by domestic animals, uh, outnumbering wild species by more than eight to one. Um, sheep and goat was the most common animal, followed by cattle, horse, and pig. So we're seeing that same order over and over again, sheep and goat, and then cattle, horse, and pig. Um, less common animals that were found in Santa Fe were deer, chicken, rabbit and hare, and a number of fish and wild fowl. Um, so some local game meats are still coming into Santa Fe. They would have had to have been brought in. Um, analyzing this collection by meat weight, like we did with the others, cattle provided the most meat. So people are eating primarily beef, followed by sheep, horses, then pigs, deer, chickens, and then very lastly, rabbits and fish. Um, and just to put it in perspective, the combined meat weight from domestic animals versus wild animals um, is a ratio of 28 to 1. So the collection uh, was made up of 4,527 pounds of domestic animal meat, potentially, uh, versus 159 pounds coming from wild animals. So it's a really big difference. Um, the variety of wild birds and fish in the assemblage indicates that they were more consistently sought out than game animals, so uh, deer, rabbits, or hares. And we saw that at the other sites as well. Um, one thing to note is that the birds that we're seeing include birds that live in different environments. So we have waterfowl like ducks and geese, as well as grouse, which would live in a brushy forested area, and then a variety of raptors. So even though Santa Fe is an urban area, um, people are accessing different parts of their landscape and environment and still bringing those foods to um, this urban area. And then the last site that we compared to was Awadavi Convento, which is um, a religious mission site. Um, so this would have been inhabited both by indigenous people and uh, Franciscan friars. Um, however, unlike the other sites, it would have been mostly indigenous people uh, with just a couple, maybe a handful of Spanish Franciscan friars sent by the government. So the, the ratio of people here is very different from the other sites. Um, the, the faunal collection from Awadavi was made up of over 4,200 specimens. And like the other sites, it contained the same domestic animals, especially sheep and goats, but unlike all the other sites, um, it was actually dominated by wild species about two to one. So we're seeing a complete flip from the domestic species that dominate all of those other privately owned sites, um, farm sites or Santa Fe. Um, 
And the wild species that we found here included rabbit, hare, beaver, porcupine, bobcat, badger, coyote, and bighorn mountain sheep. So there's a lot more variety in the types of species we're seeing here as well. Um, an analysis over time actually showed that uh, sheep and other domesticated species replaced large game in the indigenous diet at Awadabi over time. Um, so they are going out and hunting less and instead uh, eating the readily accessible domestic species that were living at the missions farm. Um, but over time, rabbits and hares remained really prominent and popular in the diet. And um, the rabbits and hares were found in equal numbers in contexts associated with both the friars and the Pueblo people living there. Um, so the friars are purposefully eating a food that is associated with Pueblos. And then the other half of their diet was mostly sheep and domestic food. So they are uh, kind of towing the line between traditional Pueblo foods and then traditional Spanish foods. Um, whereas the Pueblo living here are trying to continue to eat foods that are they're used to eating like rabbits and hares um, and then replacing sheep into their diet instead of large game that they would have gone out and hunted. Um, all right. So the kind of big conclusion we can draw is that foodways and diet in New Mexico in the 17th century differed a lot more between religious sites and secular sites than they do by wealth or status or location. Um, the consistency in animals recovered from Santa Fe and the ranches are really showing that these private households are approaching their diet and the use of animals in really similar ways. And it suggests a strongly shared sense of cuisine among Spanish colonists with domestic animals dominating the diet, um, but with fish and wild birds supplementing that diet more so than any kind of wild game. Um, for my master's thesis, the research I did focused a lot more on LA 20,000 compared to Awadavi, the mission site. And what I had found there was that the inhabitants at LA 20,000 may have used uh, their food um, as well as the dishes that they ate on to emulate a higher status Spanish identity. Um, we already know that the people living here were wealthier colonists, but it would have also benefited the farmers from displaying a high class uh, in terms of economic advantage uh, and showing solidarity with people they're hoping to trade with. Um, and then we can see that similarity compared to what we saw at Santa Fe, which would have been the economic center of the area. So they're eating the same as the other high class people uh, living in Santa Fe. Uh, and it also would have distanced themselves a little bit socially from any of the indigenous laborers working at their farm for them. Um, in terms of the plants in their diet, however, they did adopt local foods um, and exchange knowledge with their indigenous laborers, probably because they're working with them on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in a farm setting. Um, so Awadavi, however, ate a much more mixed diet than the Sanchez site. The Pueblo living there replaced large wild game with large domesticated animals. And that had more to do with uh, accessibility um, and continuing to consume rabbits and hares would have been a really easy part of their diet to um, continue to uphold while living under the constraints of the Spanish mission. Whereas the friars at the convent would uh, have shown solidarity with the Pueblos that they were trying to convert by consuming rabbits and hares, um, the same kinds of foods as them, but then they would also consume European foods recognized in the politically and economically powerful Spanish circles. Um, and that would have been beneficial to their success of their mission um, while also maintaining power in the region and over the Pueblos themselves. Uh, so the big conclusion is that the regional data indicate that um, the religious versus secular identities of each site affect the diet far more than social or economic class with a surprising regularity to the meats that were incorporated as part of the Spanish colonial diet at this time.
Thanks. Thank you. Excellent. So if anyone has any questions, you can put it in the chat um, and I'll ask them. Um, but I'm going to get this started. I have two questions. One is, um, what was the most surprising thing that you found? Like, um, either object or fact <laughs> or whatever. I think I was really surprised to find the the horse bone that had arthritis. It's not surprising once you think about what a harsh environment that is and like how hard animals would have been worked. Um, I just never seen that before. So it really baffled me when I first came across it. It took me a long time to figure out what was going on. Um, so I think that was really interesting. And uh, I think it makes you think more about like the day to day of how hard it would have been both on the people and the animals to live in this environment. Okay, thank you. Um, so another question that I don't know if you know this, uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking from what I do know about the history of the Southwest and the Pueblo Revolt. When you talk about how like the friars ate local foods for the Pueblo's acceptance, um, mm -hmm. do you know what the re what happened there sort of to the friars during the Pueblo Revolt? Like, you know, did they get hung and it didn't matter that they had tried for acceptance or you know, had there been some sort of acceptance by the Pueblo people that, you know, maybe they weren't attacked in, during the Pueblo revolt to the same extent that you would be at like Pecos Pueblo where they, you know, hung the, you know, friar and stuff. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head what happened specifically at this one. Um, I know it doesn't go well for a lot of the friars in the Pueblo revolt. Uh, they're like definitely targeted as like having yeah. been kind of like not like overlords quote unquote but yeah maybe. the encomienda <laughs> system is, is just a hair above slavery let's be real yeah <laughs> it's it's not a good labor system um i think it works more in in their own minds of saying like oh they will accept me um and there is some acceptance a little bit in terms of pueblos accepting christianity but it might be more of like a the lesser of two evils. Yeah. Um, so how well that worked leaves little to be said. Um, but we do know that like the the missions were super powerful in terms of the economics of the area. Like there, I know that they influenced a lot of the goods going in and out of New Mexico and a lot of the money going in and out. So it probably was more beneficial for them to, uh, you know, align themselves with the upper Spanish classes because they had a lot of the power in that region anyway. Okay. Um, we have another question. Um, were there any reptile bones found? Um, there were a couple. So LA 20,000, I know had a couple of frog bones, um, but it also sits on a marshy area. So those were assumed to be um, just animals that would have been living nearby anyway. Um, and none of them had butchery marks on them. So there's no indication that they were eating reptiles. Frog there's legs. also no indication they weren't eating reptiles. They could have easily have been doing that. Um, but yeah, I know that LA 20,000 is situated more on like a, a stream in a marshy area than the other two uh, ranch sites that I looked at, the other two farm sites. So there were more fish and more amphibians there, um, but it's still like such a minuscule number. And then those bones comparably are just so much smaller. It's hard to, um, sometimes they just don't survive. And that's part of the problem, the nature yeah. of archeology. span Yep. Um, another question we have is, did the missions produce uh, agricultural products rather than domestic animals? Or is it a mix or? Um, so the, the, mis the missions or the ranches, sorry. Uh, it says missions, but you know. Um, so yeah, so they definitely produce a lot. I know that um, some of the an big animal byproducts were um, tallow, which is like an animal fat that's used in candles, and then um, leather products, because uh, the, the main industry in Mexico was mining, and they used a lot of those candles and then like leather bags um, a lot in Mexico. So they're trading back and forth between those two regions locally. Um, and then, like I said, the missions had 
most of the power and they had most of the animal herds there. So their, their herds outnumbered everyone's by far. Uh, so they were definitely producing um, like wool blankets and stuff locally as well. Okay, we have about two more questions. Um, at the large ranch, was there a differential distribution of meats, such as, you know, more animal bones of one type being associated with like maybe where labor housing is for individuals working on it? Um, so I didn't get to do too much spatial analysis because a lot of the bones excavated in the 80s and 90s at the Sanchez site had lost their provenience um <laughs> that happens yeah having worked with legacy collections and other places i understand um so i did just uh i looked at the collection as kind of one large assemblage um but i'm hoping in the future we can try to pull out a little bit more more nuanced um spatial analysis but it also a lot of our um fossil remains came from the trash midden at the site where everything was just kind of dumped so if there's different people living there, they may have all put their stuff together anyway. Yep. It's hard to parse that out. Okay. Um, we have another question from Liz. Uh, first, I apologize for asking about fish. Uh, Liz is a fish ex expert, if anyone yeah. doesn't know that. Uh, she was wondering whether you knew anything about the proportions of imported marine, such as, uh, I'm gonna mess this up, Liz, sorry. Bacalo or salt cod versus local freshwater fish in some of the sites, because uh, that could indicate a bit of assimilation to the local foodways, a continuation of post medieval, post medieval commercial European fish consumption, or a combo of the two. Um, I know for LA twenty thousand, there were only thirty three fish bones found there, so it was very small, um, and most of them were like local freshwater fish. I think though, if I remember correctly, in the inventories where they're listing everything they're bringing to New Mexico. So that's where all those numbers about like how many sheep and horses they brought. Um, I think there's information in there about like dried shrimp or some like something weird, like a weird dried seafood that they're bringing in. So there might be more information about um, salt fish there that I just kind of overlooked because I was looking more at like how introduced species adapted into the environment um but i do remember something weird about like a dried shrimp that the fryers were bringing with them so i can look into that liz and uh i'll just email you because i know you personally <laughs> yeah dried shrimp that doesn't that sounds like something you get in really bad ramen at like shaw's it or was, something it was really yeah i remember reading that and thinking it sounded gross <laughs> yep um, okay, our last question is from Dave. Do you think it's likely they were raising horses as a food source, or is it likely that a, like a horse broke its leg and it made sense to eat the meat rather than waste it? I think it's definitely the latter. Um, the fact that we know the horse bones that we have are from old animals. We have that horse bone with arthritis. So I think these horses are getting like put through the ringer they are working really hard. Um, and then it's probably just a resourceful thing of saying like, that's a lot of meat to let go to waste, um, especially in a desert environment where you don't have, you know, lots and lots of other meat sources. Um, they're not bringing a lot of wild game in. So I think whatever they had there on the ranches and farms, they had to be really thrifty with. Um, so yeah, I think that's absolutely what happened there. Okay. Well, those are the questions we had time to get to tonight. Um, thank you, Anna, for talking with us. And thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing many of you um, at our meeting next month, um, which I forget the date now, but it's going to be Calvin, as Vic said earlier. So have a wonderful evening, everyone. And All thank right. you. Thanks so much.